Oh, there you are. Thank you very much. And I'm at last on the screen and we can start this conversation. So welcome to everybody. Um, I hope you are all excited to listen to another session of our Future Africa Transdisciplinarity Dialogues that we're hosting. Um, this one today is the third one of, of the series of, of dialogues. And um, if I can just remind you, the previous, previous dialogue, we had very interesting discussions on all kinds of new concepts and new ideas coming to the fore. I think the idea of scaffolding that um, um, Roderick Lawrence mentioned in his presentation is definitely one of the new ideas that, that came, comes to mind. So based on, on what we've learned, and please note that those webinars and all the webinars will be available on our website for those of you who can't attend this morning. Um, and all kinds of conversations follow after our, our webinar. So we will try to keep everybody up to date with that. So I'm not going to waste time. I just want to welcome Niraj and Matthias for today's session. And very excitingly, we are having them live in Oslo at a conference that is um, based on transformative research and innovation. And they also have sessions there on transdisciplinary research. So it's going to be very interesting to hear what they say. And I'm going to move myself now, and it's over to you, Niraj and, and Matthias, and very welcome. Uh, thank you so much, Hester, and good morning, everyone. I'm so lucky to be sitting here with my good <laughs> friend, Matthias. Um, we are... Well, I mean, I'm lucky as well. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> we are coming to you guys live from Norway uh, in Oslo, where we are here at the Afino conference. And we were going to do the dialogue anyway. And we thought if we're here together, we might as well be on screen together and have this conversation. Um, so um, I, I wanted to reflect a few things from the people I met uh, in advance of the conference, which will start later on today. And uh, uh, many of you may know the reference to Kevin Bacon with the six degrees of connectivity. And certainly when it comes to transdisciplinarity and transformative research, Matthias is the Kevin Bacon of it. He seems to be connected to everyone all over the world when it comes <laughs> to anything that's transformative or transdisciplinary. Um, so Matthias has an extensive, comprehensive background with publications and citations. I'm not going to go through it, but we will make it available to, uh, to all the participants. But I just want to add one particular area from his bio, which his areas of expertise include philosophy of science, ethics of science, food, uh, food ethics, technology assessment, and science for policy. Uh, and his uh, topics of interest include aquaculture, seafood, food ethics, value studies, the precautionary principle, uncertainty and com complexity, practical ethics, integrity in science, and public participation. So um, you can only imagine what dinner time conversations with Matthias <laughs> must be like, and I had a chance to be involved in a few of those. So with that sort of range and breadth of experience and interest, um, it gives me pleasure to invite my dear friend Matthias to give some opening comments and words, uh, particularly around his journey toward transdisciplinarity. Well, thank you very much, Neeraj, and and thank you also to Hester and to Future Africa for inviting me to this. I, I really feel honored. And I, I, I hope we can sort of start a discussion which is also continuing in you know future Africa and all of that. You ask about my journey towards um, transdisciplinarity. I have to explain to the listeners here maybe that my, my study background was from philosophy and mathematics. And, and, and that may sound to some people maybe like a strange combination, but it's basically because I started out with the, with the, with the intuition that our concepts matter. You know, they, they matter how we grasp the world. And I wanted to understand what is behind those concepts because concepts, we know different, different languages and people use them differently. So concepts matter. And what can be given that we maybe have some what can we follow from that? What can follow? You know, this is what logic is all about. 
So this was my original interest and the importance of concept. And as we know, uh, concepts are not just mirrors of a reality, right? Uh, there is this uh, famous saying from Jean-Paul Sartre, is sort of that he, he enters the cafe and he sees that his friend Pierre is not there, right? I mean, it is far beyond what we what we actually sort of perceive, how we use to understand our world with, with the concepts, how we describe the world. And sometimes that changes also, you know, you have a perception and then some event can lead to a change of that perception, right. a total paradigm change. Now, this is all about the concepts. And then very quickly, I turn to say, to ask the question, how do these concepts fare when we do science, right? And how is it that not everybody agrees on that? And how is scientific change coming about with these concepts? And the one thing that interested me at the time and still does, was actually earth science and uh, the move from continental drift to plate tectonics. And why was it that it wasn't accepted immediately One, you know, even though there was quite a bit of evidence for it? Why was there such a strong opposition towards it? And then I, I learned, and that was a look at history, you know, how do concepts fare in our social reality? And all of a sudden, I, I discovered basically what you can call social complexity because in real life things are not logical things are not always rational you right. know and there's all kind of misunderstandings and power games going on so and, and that was important to understand even our sciences which were supposed to be so rational and so logical so that i discovered this social complexity and from there on, I said, well, and how do, do they have an impact on policy? And that's when I discovered what was called post-normal science. And uh, this was done by Silvio Fontovic and Jerry Roberts. I'm sure you can give references later if you want to. And, and Silvio is still a good friend of mine nowadays. And basically their insight was that we always have these imperfect, imperfect notions, grasp, a grasp on reality. There's always major uncertainties. There are high stakes and there are disputes about our concepts and values, but still we have to make urgent decisions, right? This is for the policy. Now, and, and that sounded really what, what I experienced. Also, I have been involved in, in science for policy. So, and if you want, enter that area, you come up to the ethics. You know, I mean, what is the right course to do that? What, how can we take on responsibility if all these things are so uncertain, if our science even sometimes is in dispute? We see this, you can see this even, you know, things like climate change. There is still debate in some corners about that, right? Anyway, so how, how, do, we, how do we go about that? And what irritated me sometimes I studied actually then fish farming in Norway and its history. What irritated me was the power games about expertise. That there were groups that are saying, oh, we are the right people to be asked about this, mm -hmm. you know, and it's only us, not the others. Particularly if you were whatever in from a technical bra uh, discipline or, or natural science, the social scientists were out or, you know, or, or the economists were saying these things. And but in reality, it turned out that that was always too narrow a grasp on the problem. So expertise was, was a question. And then I discovered there are all kinds of sources of knowledge around. You know, there is folk knowledge, traditional knowledge, uh, knowledge that is related to cultures, and there is indigenous knowledge systems. And the point is that sometimes those other knowledge systems are doing in practice much better than the scientific ones, but they didn't communicate. So this was basically leading me up to all these things about um, transdisciplinarity, which I then developed with Peter Gluckman uh, from New Zealand. And, and we got this interest and in how do we sort of go about making a change if we have all these sources of knowledge, um, but we, we are stuck in these social complexities, right? That was my move to transdisciplinarity. Um, Matthias, it's such a beautiful story. And, and in the telling of the story, 
I could feel the sense of transformation that you yourself went through. And, you know, starting off in mathematics, two plus two is always going to be equal to four, right? <laughs> yeah. There was something so absolute about that. And then your transition to, well, life is about perception, how we see things. And it is essentially in the eye of the beholder. Mm -hmm. There's such a subjectivity to it. And with multiple expertises and multiple subjectivities, how do we get coherence or convergence into taking action together as society? Yes. Yeah. So uh, a beautiful, beautiful story. So that comes to the question of why do we need this now? You know, transdisciplinarity, uh, we have complex problems. And what differentiates transdisciplinarity as an approach or a lens from other complex problem solving approaches? And you mentioned post-normal science, for example. Well, first of all, um, I mentioned one, one core sentence of post-normal science is that our decisions are very often urgent, you know, even though they are highly complex. And even though there's a lot of uncertainty about them still, right? right. So we have to make decisions and we realize we, I guess also the audience will know a lot about the SDGs, right? Mm -hmm. And <laughs> the goal was that we will be at least halfway there by 2030. We are far from it. And assessments that were made even by the UN were telling us, are, are telling us that our sciences have not helped to be there in time, right? So something is, is seriously wrong with the way we try to solve the problems that the SDGs are to overcome, basically, right? So that means that we, all of us, have to make a real effort to overcome that. Now, and yeah, and we, we have now mentioned this issue of complexity. Just just remember that complexity does not just mean that it's complicated, right? It's far more. There is unpredictability. There is the connectivity. You have a system here, but then the system borders are always open to other systems. They interact and systems can change like that to a different state. All of these things are, are in there. And so we, we, we cannot have one tool. We do have many models. We right. do have a lot of models, and some of them are quite useful, but only partially, right? We need to get together and say, hey, what is in our toolbox? Can we use that for the benefit of all of us? Can we improve our way to the SDGs? This is uh, the motivation for it, right? Right, absolutely. Um, and and particularly with transdisciplinarity compared to the other tools, um, and everyone has their favorite tool, and you know you've got to find the right tool for the right task. No, no actually, and and uh, in a way, some people may think this is a little bit. Uh, it sounds, you know, like we despair. You know, oh, this is all too complicated, and nothing is useful. That's not true. A, a lot of you people and other people here at the conference, in other words. They have studied tools and approaches that are useful, but you have to realize, you have to reflect on that and say, hey, maybe only to a certain degree, right? right? Or maybe in a, only in a given setting. And, and that setting is typically more complex. You have to get into a dialogue with the people that are really affected by the issues. Right. And, you know, just let me mention one of the things about transdisciplinarity. It all starts already with, you know, what is the problem, right? Because you, you cannot go out, like I have met so many people, for example, in aquaculture, who say, oh, yes, yes, by 2050, we will be 9 billion people or 10 billion even, right? So how do we feed them? We don't have enough food. We can produce the aquaculture food, right? Yeah. Now, and, and then they come up and say, how do we increase production? What they don't see is the complexity of it. It's not just the amount of food, right? And that's maybe not even the main issue. It's the distribution, it's the political regulation, and all of these things hang together, right? So this is the complexity. What I wanted to say was something else. I forgot it. <laughs> no, uh, well, anyway, uh, the real issue. Um, yeah, no. Let me let me just say then uh, we have to find ways how we go about this differently, 
right? And um, and that starts with defining what the problem really is and for whom. There is this old uh, joke, basically, that um, uh, you know you 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 know all about the statistical type one and statistical type two fallacies, right? right. But then there is the uh, type three fallacy, which says, "Oh, very good science, but altogether the wrong problem." Right. And and that I mean, it sounds a little bit not so serious, but it is it is very often the issue, right? It's not the problem that buzzes the people because you haven't negotiated it. Right. And that's where it starts, transdisciplinarity. Um, and and that's that's a really nice way of putting it, where we we now, together with transdisciplinarity and other methodologies, have a good toolbox. Yeah. But very often we look at our tools and we say, what can we make with these tools rather than go out there and say, what is the problem? And let's yes. then go to our toolbox yes. and see what we can apply. Yeah, and let that let, let dis be discussed among us right. and say, hey, listen, folks, you may not be a scientist. Why, what I have done is whatever, risk research or something like that, and I can do this. And then people can say, yeah, but there are some other boundary issues here that you haven't thought up and then we can negotiate that absolutely and and so so the articulation of the problem and how we nuance it through these various stakeholder perspectives is key which leads me to the next question because different actors or stakeholders in society whether it's politicians whether it's business people civil society local communities researchers and academics uh, are motivated by different things, mm -hmm. right? And so when we're supposed to get together and people have different levers mm -hmm. that act yeah. them, uh, cause them to drive, there has to be some sort of philosophical underpinning of why we take on these things. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and you and I have had many conversations mm -hmm. drawing on your philosophical background. Um, so, so what would you say these philosophical underpinnings are when we look at these complex problems and us getting together to work uh, on these issues. And, and that has implications on our social contract as well. Well, yeah, it's, it's sort of, um, all of us have a tendency to easily fall for some short slogans and, you know, short, whatever, you know, graphs on the world, you know, oh, the world is like that. Right. And, oh, I'm a scientist. Whatever I say is just objectivity. It's just objective, right? Now, this is easily, you know, shared among us because it's, it's easy. And even the philosophers, you know, if you look in the history of philosophy, what is knowledge? Oh, knowledge is justified true belief, right? Uh, that sounds so easy. But basically, if you look at all the pieces of knowledge that we have, that we think we have, it's all colored by a certain kind of perspectivity, right? We, we, we never get the whole picture. We, our concepts are never really, um, you know, just pictures of reality. Right. And, and they're fragments. And so the sciences even, even though people have dreamed about reductionism, you know, reduce it all to whatever quantum mechanics or something like that, uh, no, it's it's patchwork. It's a patchwork of different pieces of knowledge, uh, different models together. So all our knowledge is colored by this perspectivity. Now, the difference of scientific knowledge between, let's say, indigenous knowledge or other folks' knowledge is the way how we justify it. Right? In 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 science, you need to have an experimental method or or you know some recorded observations or whatever it is, right? Uh, there is a, 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 a test to, to that that is defined. In, in other, in folk knowledge and also in indigenous knowledge, it is based on trust and trust on the integrity of the people that convey it. Right. You know, if, if the elder people say, hey, guys, this worked in the past, you trust those people that they give you a good picture of it and a trustworthy picture. So it's it's a different kind of irrationality, but it's still irrationality. Right. Right. So and 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 that is you have to take uh, that into account. We work with different kinds of knowledge systems. All the knowledge systems have a certain perspectivity, but the problems are so complex. So the best thing we can do is to put these together and work them out. 
in combination with each other. Um, so that's very interesting. And, and I like the notion of it, different knowledges being a patchwork. Yeah. And together, they all form part of a whole yes. uh, and complete the picture. But embedded in those different knowledge systems are power imbalances. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. And and I want you to expand on that. And because this might be one of the biggest impediments we have on putting these knowledge systems and, and, and this tapestry that we weave together is the imbalances that might sort of uh, inhibit that. Now, that was also one of the issues that I have studied many times. Um, very often we, we see that there is very useful and good knowledge around somewhere and it's not used. It's actually often suppressed, right? And how come? Well, because then there are powerful actors and in, in their interests are just different, right? right? And uh, we find ourselves maybe then in the company of relatively powerless people uh, and scientists can be among them, right? Even you have a lot of titles and so, but you don't make an impact. Um, so, so how do we go about that? Well, and that is a real issue. And it's it's hard to say there is a solution to that. No, maybe not. But at least the one thing we need to do is don't be alone. We cannot do transdisciplinary work alone. You have to build up teams. You have to build up networks. You have to build up a, a, a resonance in community, right? And, and power is actually in not only the number of people, but in the voices of the people in the end. There is a way to sort of uh, at least resist some of these power mechanisms. I've been working on food systems, and I have this journal called Food Ethics. And one of the issues that I meet time and time again is that there is a group of scientists that thinks we can change our global food systems top down. Okay. Right. We just design the ideal system that is in harmony with nature, that looks very healthy, and it's sort of defined here. We are the FAO also, and the FAO can say, oh, yes, and we need to, you know, use all the good technologies and all of that all over the place, right? Top down. But then there are the other people that say, hey, there are so many different ways to do, you know, to produce food and to distribute food and to consume it. And, and actually, many ways of them are sustainable, right? right. So there is um, different ways of producing something that is sustainable. We have to ask the question, whose sustainability are we talking about? And then develop it from the bottom up, right? right? So, and, 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 and that, these are real issues. Now, the problem is that these two approaches very often conflict, right? And uh, I'm not saying that any top down is is bad or or you know too much power uh, relevant uh, related, but I, I think we need to have a, a strong consciousness from the bottom up how we what we take on how we produce you know better solutions in the food and in all kind of other areas as well. So um, power, yes, we we. You know, at, at one point, even as a scientist, you may come to a point where maybe you become an activist or something like that, because you feel a lot of pressure from from corners where you don't want to have that pressure because you think it's misguiding and in the end it's bad for for the people. But yeah. Um and and so I think it's very interesting the the top down and the bottom up, and we often talk, well, we need both. Yeah. talk about how we need both and where the two shall meet yeah. you know might be the sweet spot of of impact and action but essentially and and coming back to your point on networks and find the people and that echo chamber is essentially about creating a movement mm -hmm. right this mobilization so td is not new transdisciplinarity it's been around for 50 years 50 or so years, right yeah. but it's getting a lot of attention now and and why do you think is that just part of the trajectory of growth over the last 50 years or is there something happening in the world now that's making us stop and say 
hold on, business as usual is not going to cut it. Yeah, it's both uh, in my mind. Yeah. I mean, there may be different explanations, but I have been studying also the early, uh, you know, science of transdisciplinarity and the discussions about it. It has been supported quite a bit in the beginning already from UNESCO, right? Right. I, I think the difficulty in the in the in the early years was that it was too much relying on philosophical concepts. It was a philosophical talk, you know, about epistemology and blah blah blah, and all of these things. People couldn't translate this to how to do it. Right and and why what what is what is the real anchor in reality that makes us shift from what we traditionally do to TD? But that came up in the late nineties and and two thousands, and it was as I said post Norman science uh, the realization realization that um, most of the problems that we deal with are so called wicked problems. That is, they are only vaguely defined. They don't have a logical endpoint, a solution. It's, you know, just things hopefully become better. And then we were talking about mode one and mode two science. That is, even the policies realized that they cannot solve big problems by just leaving it to the disciplines to move on their own speed, on their own engine. And they build up programs how to fight uh, the war against cancer, for example, right? right. And they build up teams about this. So the problems were all of a sudden coming from the outside. And they said, you, you know so much, help us solve that problem, you know? And that was a, a, a mode two science and that was taking over. And you can see this, for example, here in Europe in the policies of the uh, European Union for funding research, you know? In the beginning, it was just, you know, uh, studying, for example, consumers or, or or patients in in healthcare and all of that, but later on it's moved to say, well, get them involved, and and now it's really sort of get them involved in the very beginning. It's sort of what they call ethics by design, right? Right. Talk about all the values that we are concerned with, not at the end point when you have developed the technology, but already from the start when you do that, and 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 that move, you know, really to open up. For, for all these different groups to formulate the basic values. Hey, this is our problem. And this is where we want to be. Values are where you want to be in the future. The right. kind of future that you want for yourself and for your kids, right? So, and, and, and that sort of thing, to move that, so to say, upstream, yeah, yeah. right? Not downstream in the, in the research, to move that. And, and that realization came just in the last 15, 20 years or so. But now it really, and it always takes time before things change in policy. And now it, I think it's about to change also in, in the science policy. And, and so, uh, and we have had a conversation about this before, um, transdisciplinary research versus transdisciplinary practice, mm -hmm. because the research is the engagement with stakeholders, et cetera. And, and is it worth, differentiating between those two? Does it have implications for people embarking on this sort of research? Neeraj, you should tell the audience that you think that is very important. <laughs> and and I agree in a way what you what you think about. I'm not sure about the terms, right? right? Uh, research and practice and all of that, but never mind. But there are different stages at least. Right. You can do what you would describe as TD research in a proper way. You know, you just you know you get the network and you design, you you define the problem, you you know define the work and all of that, and actually this can be out of your professional interest. You know, the right way to be a scientist today is to be a transdisciplinary scientist. Yeah, but well, particularly after you've done it once, or you know, you there is. The difference can be in the personal involvement, right? Right. I mean, how are you as a person, as a whole person, relating to that? Yes, you know, on one hand, you can say, oh, that's my job. You know, I'm, I'm just a doctor, I'm just a scientist or whatever. Yeah, and we do this this way. Right. That's okay, and you can be useful still. You can be a lot of good work for that. But you will, and that is my, and I think also your experience, if you do get involved in that, there is something like empathy, 
there, there is something like it, it goes on the emotional side. You, you identify with those people that are really affected by the problem. And then you see that I'm also affected by it. Right. And you, 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 you feel that the problems become your problems as well. You are, you are really part of the community. Right. Uh, even though you come from a different angle, right? Maybe you're not part of that indigenous community, but you can identify with them and you feel it, right? It's, it's sort of, it goes, it's, it's, it's a much deeper uh, revolution than just changing the way you do things. That's what I want to say. And I think that's what you describe by practice. Um, and yeah, so it's actually being out there, yeah, uh, and 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 working for that change rather than studying the change. Exactly, yeah. But you you draw on a really important point, which is it depends on the makeup of the individual and yes. and their own personal journey. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so if you had to um, provide some advice to early career researchers, and we have many early career researchers working on a wide range of areas from Future Africa, University of Pretoria, and the networks we work with across the continent. What would your advice be for them as early career researchers interested in transdisciplinarity or any transformative uh, method of research? Um, well, there are obviously many good advices people can give to young researchers. Um, one thing, and that is maybe a little bit disappointing, there is no shortcut to doing transdisciplinarity. And actually, when you start studying, you you best start studying in a in a discipline, whatever your discipline you're interested in. And you do this properly, at least for, for quite some time, so that you get your basic craft work right. You know, because all the scientific methods and models are developed in disciplines, right? And, and the philosopher can contribute with the concepts, historian with the timelines and, and changes, and uh, the, the technologist with practical solutions, natural scientist with the principles, you know, mechanics or whatever it may be. So you have different things and you approach them with different methods and you will have to get some of these methods mm -hmm. in your backpack as your you know, as your tools when you go on the road for the transdisciplinary research. Right. Now, but how get, do you get there? First of all, you need to realize that you want to go there. And, and that is because you feel maybe connected to the real problems. So you want to go there. What do you do? That is the advice that I always give to PhD students and others. Build up your networks. And that is... Don't just think about, you know, networks for a certain position, academic position, but build up the networks of people that are that you find interesting. And that can be, and I think it should be, particularly if you want to do transdisciplinary research, that can be different people from other disciplines, right? right. In this con in this conference here, you will meet, I don't know how many disciplines, you know, they come from all corners. Right. And and uh, and that is what I did in my PhD courses also make these people, the young people connect, connect to others and think, oh, you are also interested in food, but you are an economist and I am a nutritionist and she is a whatever, a lawyer or something, right? So, but we all focus on the same issue, right? So build up these networks and see what you can do and, and uh, pay attention to these networks and open up for a learning process there. Maybe you can collaborate and all of that. So this is probably the most important thing that I can think of uh, to open up for these networks. And in a way, after you've studied all these methods that you have in the, in the disciplines or whatever, the most important thing in academic careers is the very old um, skills. Yeah. That is reading and write and listening and writing. Well, listening in particular, uh, uh, many of my colleagues, once you've become a professor like I am, it's easy to forget about the skill of listening to others because you tend to listen to yourself only. But actually, you know, really opening up and say, hey, what are they? I don't understand that. Make an effort, you know, to really listen to what the people are talking about and concerned about. 
So listening to others and talking to them in a way that they can understand, these are the basic skills that you need to bring in in this um, team building work. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so two, a uh, few very important points that I just want to touch on. Yeah. So it's the journey within. Yeah. As well as the journey without. Oh yeah. Right. Totally. And uh, and and so deep self reflection and understanding for the individual, mm -hmm. uh, and then the journey without is a journey of openness, empathic connection, humility. To really listen and understand, right? Yeah. Um, uh, in that way. And that is, I think, and the good news is that's very rewarding. If you really do that, it's it's really rewarding. You feel personally enriched, right? I mean, this is a learning process and it, it's a very nice process. The bad news is you have difficulties in organizing it even if you are lucky enough to have a position or a scholarship in a university, because very often there are no conditions for doing that. You know, oh, you are the department which is all across the campus and we never see each other, you know, and we, we don't do things together. Right. So, uh, you know, things are organized in a different way. You have to organize them yourself. And and that is a challenge very often. Absolutely, absolutely. And hopefully, technology in the world today, as we have as we have been seeing, yes, absolutely. Yes. Um, so we do have twenty minutes left, and I want to open uh, the floor for yes. questions. So um, people who are participating, uh, you can raise your hand and ask a question uh, via audio, or you can even type your question into the chat box or the Q and A box. Um, so let me see. Um, oh, so here we have a question. Uh, are there universities and institutions that set aside funds for TD research projects and even allow to teach TD? Um, absolutely important question, especially in the academic sector, funding. Yes. Um, the answer is, well, if you are there universities, the answer is yes. But the, after that comes, but only very few. <laughs> no, it's true. I mean, uh, I've been, when we wrote about these things and we are just trying to publish a paper on the um, on the institutional challenges for transdisciplinarity. Right. Some universities have gone that way. And we found some in Germany, Switzerland, and, and all of that. Now, and they actually do this. They have even special programs where you sort of uh, are encouraged to meet other disciplines when you're, you know, in your studies and all of that. Um, but there are very few. Most of them are still stuck in in concepts of scientific excellence in your discipline, right? So they want to push you forward in a very narrow way, right? And that is also how most uh, funding agency agencies operate. So, but on the other hand, there are, every once in a while, there are opportunities. And if you detect a, a real significant problem together with others, you can make your voice heard about these things. You have to start up without, you know, having the official funding or support yet. But you have to make your voice heard and then sometimes the funds come along. I mean, that is how I have made a lot of these studies um, because, um, yeah, it was not the official program to have transdisciplinarity, but we could smuggle it in. We could say, hey, these are the complex problems. And don't you agree? These are real problems. Right. And we need to approach this in a team, right? So sometimes you, yeah, have, have your voice heard uh, for others, particularly also for policymakers, go use public media, um, social media, newspapers, and and work together on that. And then it's maybe easier. Um, and that's actually a good example of a bottom-up approach, right? So yeah. the top-down approach is when donors say, we have this pot of money for these types yes. of projects. But sometimes donors don't know what they don't know. Exactly. And they don't know there may be these sorts of approaches. So 
getting together with a network, even within your university from different faculties, conceptualizing and articulating an approach that's quite transdisciplinary, right? Yeah, it is. And also try to be understanding of your, well, I'd say opponents, but you will have maybe first opponents, let's say in the university or in your funding agency, the research council, right? And they say, oh, no, we don't do it that way. You should do it like that way. And don't always, I mean, yes, there are power mechanisms, but don't always suppose that these people are, you know, evil people or, you know, want to do you bad. Um, they, most of them people want to do something good and they think it's good, right? So you need to be patient and you need to explain in, in terms like, listen, aren't you concerned about this and this and that? And we have different kind of expertise. You have to start a process where you sometimes have to involve your institutions and, and the funders on another level. And it takes some time, but uh, yeah, sometimes you succeed. And and those conversations are best had over food, right? <laughs> and that is indeed true, right? And uh, yeah, it's basically, you know, socializing also, that is right. important. And uh, as we see here, and um, as I told you also, I'm working on food systems and have a journal called Food Ethics. Food is something that unites people. Food is highly um, value infected. Right. And, and actually sharing food is sharing love. You can say affection with others. You say, I'm serving you food because, you know, I want to have you in my circles. I, you are my friends, right? This is what we do. And particularly in uh, all, all the indigenous cultures know that. I mean, this is what you do when giving food and, you know. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, and it's also the equalizer, right? Yes. Uh, in, in some sort of way. So we have another question. Okay. What is the place, role, and practice of imagination in a transformatory TD approach? Very good question. Yeah. This was a question by Mark. Mark, this is a very good question. And I just want to tell you, I don't know where you come from, but many of you people are come from the sciences or, or the social sciences or whatever. One thing we, where we tend to forget is the power of art, imagination, and, and uh, other forms of representation of, you know, elements in our life that have the value. Sometimes people say this is just an aesthetic value, but it's not just an aesthetic value. Mm -hmm. I have had several projects actually where we actively involved artists. In Canada, it was with an, with an indigenous artist, you know, to provide a bridge from our Western concepts to also, you know, their ways of thinking. And we had other artists involved in other projects that followed the whole process and were depicting this. Artists are engaging. Artists challenge us. Artists go around in a future that is not realized yet. It's all about imagination, imaginatives. And uh, the same about, you know, the narratives, you know, really writing a good narrative about a future, for example, or, or, or even a past that can guide us toward the future is highly important. So imagination, don't forget it. You know, this, try to include it as much as you can and relate to people that are not only problem solvers, but are creative, imaginative, and involve them. Um, and, and I would add to that, that we often so busy doing work that we don't give ourselves the space uh, yeah. for expansive thought and a creative imagination and so dedicating time for that which might just be a walk through the woods or a sport or whatever it is that that allows one to shift paradigm right yeah we have by the way yeah we in, in bergen here in norway we have what we call the workshops not the workshop but the workshops going through the mountains and discussing things anyway but i, I just want to say i mean one of the functions i remember we had a, a project in bangladesh about the climate change with, with farmers and everything. And we had this artist and he made us all draw, you know, you know, weather phenomena or other things. We all had paper in front, we had to draw. Now, 
as you say, I mean, there's nothing better as an equal as there were women who were illiterate, you know, and there were old men who only were sort of working in religious terms and all of that. And we were all sitting there with a blank sheet and had to depict what did a thunderstorm look like, right? Right. <laughs> and you go like, and you exchange these things. We were all very equal and it was very funny and it creates a bond. But from that bond, we could sort of really develop an approach to the issues. So very important and yeah, um, try to integrate it. Uh, absolutely. And I, I will say for uh, many of the participants on this call that um, uh, at UP, we have a, a, a transdisciplinary working group mm -hmm. that is actually bringing all these tools like these drawings, yeah, yeah, et cetera, yeah. so that, that people can engage in a yeah. more sort of meaningful way. Uh, we have another question here, which is TD approach certainly presents opportunities and benefits. Does the TD approach pose any risks for indigenous knowledge and indigenous IP? Yes. The answer is yes. Um, and, but the risks are there uh, if you are not fully aware of those risks. You, you that I mean, that means coming from an academic institution and all of that. There is the risk that indigenous communities are just used and are exploited, that their knowledge is exploited and all of that. That is in a truly transdisciplinary setting. Uh, the whole role of leadership, for example, of the project is to be negotiated. And, you know, the transdisciplinary, the indigenous people can have the leadership or another folk. I mean, the farmer represents the farmers group or whatever, right. you know, they can have. It's not necessarily a scientific department or a professor of something, right, right, that needs to lead that. And that relates very much to an ethical awareness about who's going to own the data, for example. Right. Uh, who has the right to decide what is happening with these data? And and that can be very important questions about, you know, the ownership. So and, and that reflects something about the ethics of transdisciplinarity. And it has new challenges, but basically you have to develop also some of the rules while you go along and, and, and sharpen your ethical uh, awareness of these things. Um, can I ask to that point then, Matthias, you know, we have um, uh, research collaborations mm -hmm. or memorandums of understandings between yep. universities. Is there a, a type of contract, uh, an agreement that transdisciplinarians, when embarking on work with local communities, other state actors uh, and stakeholders, is there some sort of framework for that engagement? No, we don't have that yet. We don't have that. And I'm 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 not sure one will get it or one should get it. I'm not sure. Basically, in my experience, if you want to develop a good transdisciplinary project or, or something working along that, you start out by just developing contacts. You make friends with people and you say, Hey, I work with that. What is your, you know, uh, what is bothering you about this? And and I'm interested in that. Can we just talk? And, and and that building up the contact can take yeah. a year or, or, or more even, right? And you have to build up trust. And uh, that's not only with indigenous people, but also practitioners of all different kinds, right? So, and, and, and then out of this, you go together and ask the question, what can we do with that, right? So the best way to go about it is that you first formulate then what your framework could look like and then you consult the more official partners and see how can we put this into a contract or something like that. And don't forget the ethics in it, right? Right. But uh, yeah, I'm not sure that you can have a universal framework or like, a, you know, a, just a standard. You, you need to have contracts maybe at some point when money flows. Right. But if there is a universal answer to that, I'm not sure. As I said, who will own the data? There is no universal answer to that. That can be dependent on, on the situation. Okay. Uh, we have a very practical question here. How can institutions develop and implement policies that effectively support TD research while addressing challenges like resource allocation, intellectual property, and academic recognition? Yeah, good Ooh, question. Tough one, yeah. Um, because 
if you put yourself into the shoes of a you know university administrator or a president of a university or whatever right yes you are yourself as an institution you are assessed you are evaluated right how many papers do you produce scientific papers where are they published and all of that right so you are in a situation of competition right and you are assessed by certain standards now and these standards are oriented towards disciplinary excellence right most of the time if you still realize that we need to go also different ways we need to actually improve td also in our university here the thing that you can do is only to create spaces and fora where you know those that have some background and get interested in these issues can talk and develop ideas together. And you can encourage them also to do that, right? Uh, don't, don't predefine what the special issues will be, right? but let them come out of it. And you have to open this fora. That means not only interdisciplinary fora, which you should do in a university, that's the old university ideas, you know, across all the faculties, we have a dialogue, but really transdisciplinary, that is, you invite publics, uh, sectors of the public, and give them a voice. Right. Right. And and you have to create these fora, which can be just like monthly meetings, so uh, different ways. Or it can be festivals. They can be all, all kind of activities. You have to use your imagination for that. Um, and I think that links to this question, how can TD be harnessed to integrate indigenous knowledge and modern science to address societal challenges. Yes. And you talked about within the university environment and then bringing the public who have indigenous knowledge, et cetera, uh, and communities into the university environment. But I also like the idea of festivals and yes. fora that are outside of the university because in the university, it's home turf advantage, right? Yes. Uh, to use the sports analogy. Yeah. No, uh, yes, you have to bring in these. Also, I mean, it's... Uh, there are different situations in different countries, and that has to do with how indigenous communities are treated. And they're different. <laughs> I mean, they're treated differently in different countries. Uh, you know, in New Zealand, uh, you know, they, they, the Maori are quite a strong group there, and they have a powerful voice, the state run. And also in, in Norway, we have, well, they're not our Sami uh, indigenous people. Um, they're not that powerful in the end, but they are giving all a lot of benefit. They have their own college and all of that. And I'm going there to have a you know defense of a PhD about Islamic knowledge. So they are giving all the formal things, but not the deep recognition that right. their voice is really heard, right? So there is something lacking here still, even though everything looks good. And in other countries, they are simply suppressed, right? Um many of the well, Latin American and other countries. Um, so that depends, you know, how, how you integrate these is depending on your local or national or regional situation. But the most important point is, particularly if they are suppressed, make yourself a voice for them, with them, right? And in, in your institution. Um, so, and... And that's a very, very important point because the engagement with communities or indigenous groups, et cetera, is not just a checkbox exercise. No, we've done this, we've done this, but it is deep, meaningful engagement and journeying together, yeah. right? Uh, oh, Matthias, we look forward to hearing more about your visit to the Sami community and, and working with them. Um, so we have three minutes left. Okay. Uh, and so we need to wrap up. Wow, this went. Okay, good. We didn't good, even good. have a glass good. of wine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want to ask you if you could just give us a few words about what's happening here at the Safino conference. Yeah. And uh, given that you're part of the organizers, and then I'm going to grant you two wishes for transdisciplinarity. And I know you have a whole list of them, but. Uh, but okay, yeah. first, just briefly about the uh, Afino conference that is just starting now here. This was a, a, a program, five-year program, that is unfortunately now coming to an end, uh, where the Research Council said, hey, we want 
a, a, a hub, basically, to spread the word of responsible research and responsible innovation to different kind of funded projects. Right. So we had, our task was to spread this word and have activities so that the reflection on responsible science, responsible innovation was coming into these projects. And we had a, a number of projects associated with us and, and all of that. And now this is wrapping up with a lot of our uh, related to uh, PhDs and postdocs and, and other people, but also internationally. So, uh, and and unfortunately it's taking, coming to an end. The hope is of course that we can find something similar in the future, we will see. Now you have these two wishes? Yeah. Well, uh, I don't know really. Uh, the, the, uh, the one wish is um, that, The, the wish to go outside your disciplinary experiences and all of that spreads in, in the network of young researchers. And not only the wish, but only the optimism that, right. yes, I could do it. You know, I'll, okay, it goes slowly, but I'll have the patience, right? It's, I'm developing it slowly because it doesn't happen overnight. It never will, right? But still you have the strength in your back and you you feel like, Okay, I know other people have done it. I can do it as well. I can get engaged, right, in my way, and I will do that. That is the first wish, and and the second wish is, of course, that it's more a, a top-down wish. I would wish that um, funding institutions, universities, and others, nationally and internationally, would recognize that kind of activity as the activity that can lead us closer to the SDGs as we intended to do and thus come up with the necessary support of it. These are my main wishes. Well said, Matthias. We are at time, and I want to thank everyone for uh, for joining us today and the excellent questions that all of you gave. And Matthias, <laughs> oh, my God. <brother. laughs> hey, Neresh, that was excellent. A pleasure, yeah. a pleasure to talk with you, and, and an honor, really, to talk to you people here and in, in, in South Africa and other places, maybe. Uh, I'll I'll hope it's really inspiring, and I encourage you. If you have any questions, contact me. You can get the uh, email addresses. I love to be helpful in your efforts. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, Hester, over to you to wrap up the session. Right there, I am back to just to say goodbye to everybody. I thoroughly enjoyed this whole conversation and. As you were speaking, so many other aspects um, came to mind that we can still talk about. I think the one question is about still about the future of, of transdisciplinarity. Where are we at this moment and how important is this for our future? So we hope to, to touch upon those aspects with our ne next dialogue. Um, but thank you very much for this. I am really happy to have had a philosopher on board to support what we do and to really um, stress the importance of concepts, which I really think we really need. Um, and those concepts normally provides the guide for our TD research. So thank you, both of you. I hope you have a lovely time at the conference. And Niraj is certainly going to have to report back when he's back in South Africa next week. Absolutely. So thank you very much for all of this. Take care, thank colleagues. You. Okay, bye-bye. Cheers, bye. -bye. Cheers. bye.